we are to the we are in now in the last session of this talk. The speaker is Theodore Drivers from Stony Brook University, and he will give us remarks on the long time behavior of the two D Euler equation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I wish I could have been there in person. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some aspects of the long time behavior of 2D Euler. And really, maybe the title should be something like irreversibility mechanisms in 2D Euler. So the focus will really be about some features of the equations that become different at long times versus finite time. Excuse and me. And uh, yes. Just uh, I have encouraged the students to ask questions at any point. Oh, Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. <clears throat> and by and large, this will be a talk about joint work with uh, Peter Constantine, uh, Dan Ginsburg, both of whom are at Princeton, Michele Dolce, who's now in Switzerland, Tarek El Gindi at Duke, and Inji Jong in South Korea. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning and remind everybody what an ideal incompressible fluid is. We consider bounded domains could be simply connected, could be multiply connected um, in the plane, say, um, and we're interested in the motion of an ideal fluid, which is incompressible, so preserves area. These are governed for the velocity vector field by the two-dimensional Euler equations. So here U is just a two-component vector field, which is tangent to the boundary of whatever the vessel is. So there's no flow through the solid wall. Area preserving is captured by the property that this vector field is divergence-free. And the momentum equation, which is F equals MA, involves this pressure term, which is non-locally determined in order to enforce under evolution this divergence-free property. Now, these equations, of course, are the same in any dimension, but in two dimensions, there are some structural simplifications that I'd like to discuss before we continue. So first, any divergence-free 2D vector field <clears throat> Um, can be written as the grad perp of some stream function, if at least if the domain is simply connected. There, there could be some harmonic parts if we have some homology of the domain, but let's just ignore that for, for now. So this is some scalar function whose rotated gradient, so grad perp will be the 90 degree counterclockwise rotation of the gradient. So this will be some uh, scalar function that represents the, captures the geometric properties of integral curves of U, namely its level sets um, are, are lines on which U is tangent. So hence the name stream function, its level sets are streamlines. And at each instant of time, it, it tells you how particles would move if time were frozen at that instant, they just go around. Um, <clears throat> the condition that the velocity be tangent to the boundary of the domain is just the condition that psi will be constant on connected components of the boundary, uh, which is a useful thing to keep in mind. And finally, dynamically, there's a significant simplification when you look at the vorticity, so I think as everybody here knows, in three dimensions, the vorticity is a vector field, which is Lie transported, giving rise to both transport and stretching by the, by the velocity itself. But in two dimensions, you can identify the vorticity as a scalar. Um, that scalar field is sort of a skew divergence of the vector field U. And it is Lie transported as a scalar. So there's no stretching term. It's just being pushed around by the velocity field itself. And you can, in fact, close the 2D Euler description at the level of this transport equation for this vorticity, its curl, um, via the BS of R law. So you, you just um, uh, invert the Laplacian to recover the stream function for a given vorticity. 
I, I should say that in terms of that stream function, the vorticity is the Laplacian of it, and then take the skew gradient. And now this is some nonlinear, non-local equation governing the motion of the vorticity. Now th this formulation, you can think sort of equivalently, this is an Eulerian formulation, and you can think equivalently how things look on the Lagrangian side, and there it's sort of deceptively simple. You just have the, at each instant of time, the vorticity is some volume preserving rearrangement of its initial data. And this volume preserving transformation is what you would get by evolving particles underneath the flow generated by you over the course of that time. Okay. So we're interested in what types of things we see. Um, in this equation as you go for a long time. And the first, the first information to account for are invariants of the motion. So energy is, of course, uh, an ideal invariant. And uh, energy is something that holds for Euler equation in any dimension, formally, for smooth solutions. Um, and to get energy conservation, you just use uh, that the velocity is tangent to the boundary and divergence free in the interior. In two dimensions, because you have this transport of the vorticity function, you have, in fact, a whole infinite family of additional invariants called the Casimirs, um, which, are, which come in the form of just any continuous function of the vorticity function. That's going to be or constant in time, simply because the vorticity is some area preserving rearrangement of its initial data. So you can sort of imagine substituting in that Lagrangian formula here at some time t using the change of variables to remove the flow when you write it in terms of omega zero. And then you see this is just a time independent quantity. So, so in particular, you can choose LP norms and these things are conserved by the flow for all time, including the L infinity norm, namely the, the values of the vorticity function themselves are just being pushed around. So those are, those are conserved. Now, on some special domains, you have some additional invariants like momenta. Um, so for example, if you're on the periodic box, the, the torus, then you have the conservation of the total integral of uh, velocity. Um, if you're on the channel, you have some component of this. And if you're on the disk, then you have the analog, the angular momentum. But these are sort of fragile invariants in the sense that if you perturb the domain, these will no longer be conserved. You have some uh, work done by the pressure even for these. And so we'll mention them, but we won't uh, sort of think about these as more fundamental because our, our focus will generally be about things that could be said for more or less arbitrary domains. Okay. So the, the first theorem in, in the subject that we'll start with here is that of local, local and then global well-posedness. Um, this dates back to the 20s. So this is a very old result. And it's essentially a consequence of the L infinity L infinity conservation of the vorticity. It says that take any domain and initial vorticity function in, in C alpha. So just hold it continuous with any, any regularity index alpha. Then there exists a unique solution for all time um, in that same space. And this, by the way, you can evolve Euler, of course, forward or backward in time. It's a formally it's a reversible equation. <clears throat> and moreover, the solution in that space can only get so large. So this is an estimate on how big the C alpha norm can be. And it's double exponential in time. So it's the exponent of, exponent of an exponent. And um, what this estimate says is that under the course of evolution, this vorticity, which you can think in your head as just some patch of paint or something getting stirred around by a velocity, this vorticity will develop 
very small scale filaments, um, which get ever thinner as time gets longer. And those small scale filaments correspond to growth of, for example, gradients of that blob of temperature as you measure it. And that growth is limited only by this double exponential bound. So in principle, you know, you could have very fast stretching of this vorticity, so, uh, or filamenting uh, to be consistent with this. And in fact, this estimate is saturated for some examples. So there's, um, you know, a very recent, well, not necessarily, a recent work by Kiselev and Schwerak, which gives an example of initial data on the disk, which is smooth, um, and for which you actually have double exponential growth. So it's a real, a real phenomenon. One thing that it tells you, though, is that the C alpha space is not necessarily the right one um, to think about if you want to understand the long time picture, because at infinite time, you're leaving the space. I mean, and so even though you're global here, if you want to understand what you see at long time, this is not the right setting to consider. It tells you something, it tells you some information about filamentation, but it's not going to give you the coarse picture of what emerges at long time, which is um, which is what we'll be interested in. So for that, there's a theorem by Udovich in the 60s, which provides, at least in some settings, the right space for this other question. And that's vorticity function in L infinity. Formally, that's conserved, and Udovich actually constructs unique weak solution, which is bounded for all time, that indeed conserves LP norms. And so it's this global existence theorem that is sort of more relevant to what emerges at long time, since you start with some size in this space and you retain it for all time. So in a way, Euler is now like a compact dynamical system on that space, but it's really only compact if you endow it with some metric, which is weak stars. So you have to think about the L infinity space with the weak star topology, then 2D Euler is a compact dynamical system. Weak star just means that um, if you converge in weak star, it means that if you integrate against any L1 function, the integral of your sequence converges to the integral against your limit. And so what you can think about for that is it's sort of like taking limits where you coarse grain. So instead of the function actually converging in some stronger sense, it's like if you coarse grain with any kernel, then that object, that sequence will converge to something well-defined. So it's a way of forgetting the, the small, in, in fact, maybe infinitely small scales that will emerge in these sequences. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay, so that's a good uh, foundation for, for, for us to start thinking about the long time behavior. And a good first setting is stationary states, so, since those don't evolve in time. <clears throat> and those just satisfy this steady transport equation for vorticity, which if you recall that the velocity is this rotated gradient of stream function, is just the condition that gradients of vorticity and gradients of stream function are, are everywhere collinear. So there are some special families of these steady states that you can write down explicitly on special domains. So on the periodic channel, you have shear flows, so velocity that varies in intensity as you go across the channel, but only points in the direction down the channel. On a disk or an annulus, you have circular flows, which are the analog of this. And then just in, in view of this criteria, we see that one could generate potentially very large families of stationary states by simply demanding that there be a functional relationship between the vorticity and the stream function. Now, if you demand this and you recall that vorticity is the Laplacian of this stream function, then that condition boils down 
to some other PDE, some semi-linear elliptic PDE that you have to solve with boundary condition of constant on the boundary. <clears throat> and if you generate a solution to this, then it will automatically, because of this condition, be a stationary state for Euler. So in principle, this gives you a very large degree of freedom um, to move around the space of steady states. Now, this is not always a good equation. So you can think in, in your heads as an example um, where f is just linear. So f of x is lambda x. Uh, in that case, it's the eigenvalue problem. And for a certain lambda, there are no solution. For a certain lambda, there's one solution. For a certain lambda, there's many solutions. So essentially, any of those things can happen in this equation. Nevertheless, when you can solve it, you get steady states for Euler. So the first question which we're interested in is which of these steady states are stable, if any, and what shape do they take? So what do the stable ones look like? Okay. So this part of the story now goes to Vladimir Arnold, um, he considered stationary states of this type, and he realized that if one of two things was true, namely if the derivative of this profile function f was positive or if it was negative but not smaller than minus lambda 1, where lambda 1 is the first positive eigenvalue of the negative Laplacian on your domain, so if either one of those two things are satisfied, then the vorticity function omega zero coming from this steady state is orbitally stable in L2. So that means that if you want to stay within some L2 neighborhood of that steady state, you can do so by taking initial data in an even smaller L2 neighborhood, which can be quantified. And that's an all time statement. Now, the way he saw this was through some beautiful geometric insight. So he recognized that Euler satisfies some variational principle. And that variational principle, uh, when it's discussing steady states, tells you that if you look at the so-called orbit of some vorticity function, namely, um, all those vorticity functions which can be arrived at from a given one by rearranging it by some volume preserving flow. So this is the orbit of the vorticity omega zero in the group of area preserving diffeomorphisms. And if you look at this, um, and if you uh, find a critical point of the kinetic energy um, on this set, that thing will be a stationary solution of Euler. And so these two conditions here are that you're a minimum. So this is this one is a, a minimum. This one is a maximum of the kinetic energy functional on that isovortical sheet. And stability is imparted because sort of a similar picture in finite dimension. So if you if this represents the surface of energy and these are sort of the sheets then um, it's like a well. If you perturb away, you're not, you, you don't necessarily have any tendency to converge back, but you kind of orbit around it because of the constraints of the equation, the conservations, and so on. Okay, so that's a beautiful... Uh, hi. Uh, you get, yes. Um, I suspect the students in the audience don't know what a killing field is. Oh, yeah. I'll, Okay, so I'm going to say this now. It's really not important to, um, uh, we can just remove those words. The point is if you have a vector field that, okay, so let me just say this uh, result. So, so the shape of these solutions can be elucidated on domains that possess a symmetry. So I stayed here sort of quite generally manifolds and so on, but and killing fields. But the point is, if you have a, 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 an isometry, so if you uh, if you have a symmetry of your domain, like on the periodic channel, the vector field dx is a symmetry, it's tangent to the boundary, um, then 
any Arnold st steady state has to have that same symmetry. So, so let's just look at the corollaries of this statement. On the periodic channel, all of these guys are shear flows. On the disk, the symmetry is rotation. All of these guys are radial. Um, on a spherical cap, now that it has some curvature, they're all zonal. And on the torus, where you have two symmetries, you have dx and dy then it has to have both of them. Therefore, it must be a constant, which is the trivial state. So only the zero function is stable in that sense. So this is just to say that on some special domains, we can have a picture of what these at least stable solutions look like. I don't know of examples, except for very trivial ones where the vorticity is constant. So this is exactly zero, which is excluded. I don't know of examples other than these which are stable for Euler. So this might be it. Okay. Now, what is the difficulty in studying, say, the long time behavior nearby such a stable steady state? You, you might say, well, we already know a lot about it. Uh, we know that if you start close to it in L2 of vorticity, which is not, not very much, then you'll forever stay in some L2 neighborhood. And that gives us certainly some picture. It'll look like that steady state in some coarse sense for all time. But what if we're interested in the actual long time limits where that limit is understood in that weak star sense? So if you were to coarse grain your solution by any kernel with any scale you like, you're interested in what is that coarsened picture at infinite time. Now, this orbital stability can't address that question. Um, and what's the difficulty in it? Well, <clears throat> the difficulty is that these stable steady states come in extremely large families. So the first result about this that I know is one of Chofru and Shreya, which works on an annular domain and considers some subclass of these stable steady states. And they prove a remarkable result, which is to say that if you take any vorticity function nearby that stable one, and you look at that orbit, that set I told you about where you just move it around by area preserving diffios. Then there's, the, for each di distribution function nearby your steady one, there's a unique critical point on this orbit. There's a unique other steady state on this orbit. So in a way, stationary states are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the distribution functions of vorticity when you're nearby a stable one. So that's a huge infinite dimensional family of them. They're very flexible. And that shows, since, since, by the way, they're close to the original stable one, they also inherit that stability property. So there's this infinite dimensional family of stable steady states. And in a way, it's like as a, if you start away from a steady state, they all are sort of holding on to your, your solution with ropes and solutions trying to go around. And this way, it can't get very far. That way, it can't get very far. But there's infinitely many things kind of holding on to it. And so determining where it ends up is um, obviously, in view of that picture, a very difficult question. Um, another result in line with this, which uh, I think I'm not going to say anything really about, is that a similar statement can be made at the level of the stream function and can allow you to wiggle the domain around. Um, but let, let's, not, uh, let's not dwell on that. <clears throat> okay, so so now now let's start to try to address what what can be said dynamically nearby such stable steady states. The first remark I'd like to begin with is a result of Nadarashvili on um, wandering. So this is kind of um, 
counterintuitive when you think about the finite dimensional picture. It says that some aspect of the finite dimensional picture really doesn't port over to the infinite dimensional setting, even in the natural phase space of L infinity. So, so what is the result? Um, take the periodic channel. He shows that there exists some vorticity function C, which is bounded. It's actually smooth, but let's just... Um, and some numbers, epsilon and T, so epsilon small T is going to be large. I mean, okay, actually T, sorry, T is going to be small too. Um, such that any bounded vorticity field, which is close by epsilon to this C in L infinity, so in some epsilon ball in L infinity of that function he found, has the property that after some time, capital T, the solution of Euler starting from that vorticity field will forever leave that ball. So it's like you have this point C, some ball around it, and Euler is just pushing you out of this ball. So this is somehow an obstruction for appealing to naively to ergodicity in the phase space of L infinity, which we'll talk a little bit about later. That's an important conceptual idea when thinking about long time. This is sort of the first no-go result, if at least if you interpret that um, in the strong topology of L infinity. Yeah. The proof is extremely simple. It's, it's just you look at linear coet flow on the periodic channel which is one of these Arnold stable steady states stable. And then to construct this C function, you take coet flow and you add to it a little patch of vorticity supported on this line. So coet has constant vorticity, and now you just make some bump here that connects the top and the bottom boundaries. Now, because of the stability of coet, this line has to have velocity more or less equal to what the coet's velocity is up here and more or less equal to what coet's velocity is down here for all time. So this is moving roughly at speed one, this is moving roughly at speed zero. And that means over time, you, you have twisting, you have some um, wrapping of this, the image of this line around the torus. And so why does this mean wandering? Well, you had no support of the perturbation on this side of the torus initially. It's just here. So we just want to say that any small perturbation of this system, say something with a bump here, doesn't look like this initial field later and forever. And the reason why that happens is just, be, just because of this uh, kind of wrapping property. After time, say, one, this string will wrap at least once around the torus forever. So this will just continue to generate filaments. And that means there'll be some support on this side. And because of that, you're never going to be L infinity close to the thing that just has support over here, because you're always going to have something over here. And so that's that's the main idea. Very simple. You you can you can sort of promote this example to give example of uh, growth and C alpha topology. It's what we started talking about. And there are many works that that have more sophisticated me mechanism for growth of C alpha. The work on different uh, domains like the torus where you don't have boundary and so on, but we won't, we won't dwell too much on that. So, so Nadarashvili studied a very particular setting um, and he showed that basically you have wandering and also this filamentation that corresponds to growth of C alpha norm. And you could wonder, well, it seems like any steady state that has some kind of shearing in it, which will be most of them, uh, should have a similar mechanism. And so the first result about this that I know is due to Koch, and it was followed up by Matulish, Nam, and Yudovich, which says that every steady solution of 2D Euler, with the stipulation that the flow map that it generates is not time periodic, we call that isochronal. It's it's a very special condition. I'll talk about it in a second. 
is nonlinearly unstable in the Siafa topology. Now, now, what does that mean? It means that there's some M, which is as large as you like, and some epsilon, which is as small as you like. These are just things you pick, such that there's a corresponding time T. And if you start out within epsilon of your steady state in C alpha, you can get at that time T outside of an M ball. So since this is arbitrary and this is arbitrary, this shows that you can be as close as you like here and get as far as you like here, as, at least if you're willing to wait potentially a very long time. And so this is reminiscent of the previous statement, except that it's a finite time one. So everything here, it could be long, but it's arbitrary. It just says that at least you find some kind of transient filamentation because you can get the size in C alpha to be as big as you like, but you in principle don't know what happens after that. It could sort of unfilament and get back to where it started, but as unlikely as that sounds. This result relies on a very simple Lagrangian mechanism of the of the steady state. So consider the quantity mu, which is just the gradient of the flow map. So this is the flow map for say the steady state. Now, all steady states basically have the property that you, you foliate your domain in terms of level sets of the stream function. So smooth steady states have this property. Those level sets are the integral curves of the vector field. So as long as the period of revolution on the level sets are not all the same, this mu, the gradient of the flow, will grow indefinitely just because of shearing. So in Coet flow, the flow map is like uh, x plus y t comma y. And then if you look at the gradient of this, you see that this grows like t. Same growth will happen in any geometry, any steady state, as long as time the flow map is not time periodic. Okay, so what does that mean? So here's a lemma. If this object is bounded for all time, then V is isochronal, namely the flow map is time periodic. So what does that mean? Just means that the, the level sets, the particles all revolve around in the same amount of time, making something like a fluid clock. So here I just decorate these arrows with their Lagrangian tracers. They can wiggle around over the course of time, but at some later time, they will come back to their initial configuration. For these steady states, this theorem doesn't address it, but it turns out that these are extremely rare. Um, so using that theorem I skipped over before, we can say that there's exactly one on each domain, at least if those domains are close to a disk. One, if you mod out by scaling, you could always rescale one and find a family, but yeah. Interestingly, there are sort of non-trivial ones. A trivial one is solid body rotation, which is an Euler solution. You just, you just rotate like a record player at a constant rate that will generate a time periodic flow. But there are also non-trivial ones, like on the ellipse, you have uh, uh, this type of elliptical stream function that, that also generates a time periodic flow. So this is written by Udovich. Now, the lemma that goes into this proof of this theorem is that if, if you're close and you, you can get, you can be close in C alpha and the farness later in time depends on this mu. So this is an important quantitative estimate that says that you can, this M here in the theorem is essentially related to this mu, which gets large as time gets large, as I just said, times epsilon, okay? This, this, we'll mention this again in a couple of slides. Okay. So, Udovich conjectured that long, like infinite time growth, not just this transient finite time statement, but infinite time growth um, should be a generic phenomenon. So he said that it should happen on a substantial set uh, just of initial data, but at least it should happen in, in a way such that arbitrary perturbations of steady flows um, should filament. 
and here's a numerical simulation on the torus, um, which which shows what this filamentation looks like. So you're looking at the vorticity function here, positive and negative is red and blue. And this is a perturbation. The perturbation just gets swirled around by the background vorticity and, until it spirals and these filaments form and the distances go to zero, they thin. That That's the picture of the growth that I'm talking about. So this is what you should think about when you think about the C alpha norm getting really large. Okay, so here's some recent work that we're currently um, in the process of writing. This is joint with Tarek el and Inji Zhang that goes in the direction of Udovich's um, assertion, although in the end we can say only something much we weaker. It relies, that, uh, I'm gonna give like three applications of this, this theorem that's written here. Um, and this theorem itself is something that's more general than Euler. It's just a statement about area preserving flows on a given domain. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, how do you twist it in 2D? So the picture is like this. So th this is a 2D domain and it's periodic in this direction. And the twisting just happens, you know, by by wrapping around. So just imagine you take some passive line, advect this one by speed one, keep this one fixed. It'll just wrap around and twist out. You're thinking of twisting on a torus. Yeah. So, but it doesn't have to be on a torus. It can be, like, for example, in this exam, in this example, you can regard each square cell as some. Um, in fact, in fact, the symmetry imposed here on the two torus is such that each square cell is, um, you can regard this as an Euler solution. And so thinking each one of these individually, you see this twisting happens on a simply connected domain. It's just twisting now. And if you, if you think about sort of uh, lifting to the cover of the square, so keeping track of how many times things wind around, then it's, then you can see twisting thinking about that. So, so like a radial flow with speed one here and say near zero here will twist up particles because this one will orbit much faster than this one. And any line connecting, you'll see that picture get longer and then twists. Okay, I guess it's okay. So that's fine. Say, so, so I, I didn't hear that last part. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Okay, okay. <clears throat> okay, so. So the statement here is consider any fixed uh, autonomous and non-isochronal stream function, namely something that generates a velocity field whose Lagrangian flow is not time periodic. Okay, we already discussed the special cases, what it is. We don't say anything. The statement is then that there exists some, oops, there exists some epsilon, which depends on this background, small, uh, such that for all velocity fields, which are divergence free um, and possibly non-autonomous with any, without any structure in time. So such that for all velocity fields satisfying just two inequalities. The first is that at the level of the stream function, its stream function is close to the background one in this integrated sense. This is really a very weak condition. And the second condition is that the one component of the velocity, the velocity being the perp of this, one component of that in the direction orthogonal to the, the background is small for, for all time in this integrated sense. So you could replace both of these by a stronger condition, if you like, that just says that the velocity of the perturbation is close to the velocity of the background in L1 time integrated. So very weak notion of closeness. And then the theorem is that the corresponding flow map uh, has gradient growth in L1. So, so actually what's proved is that twisting still occurs. The point is that the background, think of the background on the periodic channel 
there's some shear flow where it's faster in some regions and slower in others. This is saying that you can modify the shear flow with some time dependent wiggles, but as long as you're close in this L1 sense, particles will still be zipping around at different speeds and you will still have this twisting. It seems like a very um, sort of intuitive fact, but we, we fought a little bit to prove it. We didn't see it in the literature. Maybe someone else here knows and could alert me. <clears throat> There's a simple example to, to show why one might be sort of afraid. If you take the two torus and you put the flow sine of, X, sine of Y, something like that, so it's going this way and then this way, and you just add a little epsilon up, so, so, you're, so, so you have some drift up of any size epsilon, then the flow that you generate here is time periodic because you spend as much regions where it's going one, as much time in a region where it's going one direction as you do in the region where it's going another direction. So this property is not stable in general. If you add like a little drift on the torus and you break it, even though the background flow has the growth. And the point is that this, this perturbation is not of the type that we're talking about here because th this perturbation corresponds to a stream function like y, the function y, which is not a smooth function on the torus. So, um, so in effect, you, you, we're, we're, this closeness condition is not satisfied. Okay. But you might wonder if something like this could happen in some crazy, more non-autonomous way, even excluding that type of example. And this theorem says effectively no. Now the proof relies on considering the right quantities. So you look at sort of the component, thinking on the channel again, you look at the component of the flow in the direction down the channel times some function that localizes you to some strip here um, of the flow transverse the channel. And if these, we want to show that there's some gap between two levels which twist at different rates. So you have like channel where velocity is moving on two level sets, two, two, two lines in different directions, then F1 and F2 just localize you to this region and this region. And we want to show that there's a gap between these quantities, which would correspond to some bulk of particles moving this way and a bulk moving that way. So you can you can directly study the evolution of these two things, and it's a, it's a short, relatively short calculation. But let me just say that when controlling some errors in the difference, I actually make this statement. It's 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 at heart a topological argument. So we have to consider here here say our periodic channel, and we have to consider it on the cover. So just replacing the periodic variable by a variable on R and just considering things as periodic in that length. So here I just have copies of this torus. And then these sets here are the images of the initial boundaries. Okay, so they, they of course are periodic, so they have to be a shifting of the two boundaries are shifted every time. And the point is that there's a, there's a topological argument that tells you how many times you cross and the fact that these crossings, so this point corresponds at this point, this point corresponds at this point, and we're doing an integration over slices like this. And you, it's very important that you have some information about the parity because, they, because in this integral, you have a, like a minus coming from this end and a plus coming from this end, say. And so the parity, in terms of the values of the stream function that these carry is important to give you cancellation. And so because of that topological fact, you have some mechanism to get the smallest. Uh, obviously I didn't give enough details to, for you to understand what that m meant, but the point is just that this argument is, has some aspect which is really more topological than analytical. <clears throat> okay, so what are some implications of this result? So the first sort of addresses the last part of Udovich's conjecture, 
at least if you are nearby stable steady states. So his conjecture is for every steady flow, you should find things that lose smoothness indefinitely in time. And here um, we only consider the stable ones. So the, the theorem is that if you take any non-isochronal stable steady state, then there's some neighborhood around it in C, C alpha such that the points that start in that neighborhood and uh, get to infinity in C alpha, like T to the alpha, roughly, um, is, is dense in that ball. So you have some ball around some steady state in C alpha, and there's a dense set of initial data here, which if you flow it, will go to infinity as time goes to infinity in C alpha, at more or less the rate that the linear flow gives. So, okay. This is a bare category argument. Uh, in the past, I, we had some version of this, but we needed multiply connected domain. Now we dispense with all of that. So this is sort of independent of the domain. You don't need any boundary at all. Um, just general statements, stable steady states of this generic growth phenomenon. And it relies on this. So the point is that this is also something that holds without any uh, appealing to any boundary. And so the argument goes by the fact that any solution that's close to, to one of these guys in L2, now think of this as Arnold stable, so you're close in L2 for all time. That closeness in L2 of vorticity is in fact much stronger then we need here this L1 closeness of velocity um, to say that the flow continues to twist things up. And so we know this gradient growth of the Lagrangian flow for all nearby perturbations of stable ones. And then combining with that Koch argument that I, that I mentioned before and that quantitative bound that he gives in terms of the gradient of the flow, we can parlay that into this generic growth. But I, I won't. I won't say the details. Yeah. <clears throat> A second application is um, is about gro indefinite growth of perimeter of vortex patch. So, what's a vortex patch? Here you can see some annular region. On this annular region, the vorticity is one, and outside, the vorticity is just zero. Okay, that's what a, a patch is. And uh, the question is, does the, what happens to the boundary of this patch as time goes on? So this is kind of a funny looking patch. It looks almost like a disc, except you've got these arms and this thing is out like at distance 10 million. It's supposed to be really far. And what's the point of this? Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Is there some reason you choose this? Yeah, I'm going to describe it now. Yeah, it, it looks a little funny, but um, so the reason we choose this is because it's well known that a circular patch is is stable in L1 of vorticity. So if you take just a circular patch and you perturb it a little bit, then you'll always stay close to a circular patch. It's in fact a variational argument, very like Arnold's. So the point of this picture is that it's a perturbation of a circular patch. And these arms are really thin and this is really far away. <clears throat> but the velocity of a circular patch is solid body inside. So this is like V is R E theta inside the circle. But then outside, outside here uh, in this region, the 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 velocity in the radial direction is like one over r. So the time it takes a particle, if you ignore all these arms, just consider a circular patch. The time it takes a particle to go around and close up in the interior is uniform inside the circle. They all it's a record player inside. But outside, the time it takes to go around decreases as you get further away, like one over r. So they're slower as you go far out. And that means that there's a shearing in this region over here. It's, it's like the coet flow, if you will, but, but outside the, the, the region of the patch. Now, 
if this was just passive, then if these lines were just passive, then they would get twisted up. So they would, the evolution of them would be something like this. You know, they would get twisted up and the arms had filament and, and so on. That would cause perimeter growth. Um, this is not passive. So we need some form of Lagrangian stability, but that's exactly what we just proved. So as a corollary of that previous theorem about twisting, we can say that there exists a patch, it's, it looks like this one, with finite initial perimeter, such that uh, the perimeter of the image of this patch over time grows indefinitely, at least like T. Okay, so as far as we know, this is the first sort of example of a single patch whose perimeter grows. Okay. Any questions? Okay, final example, and then I guess I'll end, even though, okay. <clears throat> so this is really more on the Lagrangian and geometric view of the fluid. It's some form of aging that you can think about it in the flow. So to discuss this, let's, let's introduce again this group of area-preserving diffeomorphisms and let's introduce a metric there. First, let's introduce a length. So given any path through diffeomorphisms, um, uh, let's define the length of that path by the integral in its parameter from zero to one of the, of the derivative in its parameter integrated in an L2 sense in space. Okay, so that's the length. If you like, this is like the tangent, it's the velocity of this path and I'm looking at the L2 norm of the velocity and integrating it over its, uh, its duration. Now, critical points of this functional are Euler solutions. So this is uh, the observation of Arnold. And another way to say that is that Euler are geodesic on this group of area preserving diffeomorphisms with the metric that's induced by this distance. This is the L2, the L2 metric, L2. And okay, so the geodesic distance, the one induced by this, this length, we can just name it the distance in the group from say the identity element to a given diffeomorphism phi. That's just the infimum over all paths that connect identity to phi in time one and live in the group of area preserving diffeomorphisms, the infimum of the length. So you just wanna find the shortest path that connects two points in this group. Now, a celebrated result of Ilyashberg and Ratu is that the diameter, um, which is the supremum of all possible distances when you take supremum over the endpoint phi. That's infinite in two dimensions. Um, this was actually conjectured by Schnirlman in an earlier paper and proved by Ilyashberg and Ratu. Schnirlman proved interestingly that in dimensions bigger than two, the diameter is finite. So there's a real difference between two and 3D from the Lagrangian view. Okay, so now, Okay, so now what, what's the point? So consider two sets, the set of velocity fields, which are smooth, divergence-free, and have energy less than or equal to some given E naught, and then the set of accessible uh, diffeomorphisms, namely a, a diffeomorphism um, such that it arises as some time T map flowed by a velocity in this previous, um, previous space that we talked about, okay? Conjecturally, these are all diffeomorphisms. Um, I'm thinking about this, uh, I, 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 sorry, I'm thinking about adding here the stipulation that you're also an Euler solution, and in, in which case, conjecturally, it's all diffeomorphisms. Otherwise, if I just say it like this, it is all diffeomorphisms in the connected component of that identity. <clears throat> okay. Now, so if you have a diffeomorphism 
which arises as a time t map of, of something in here, then you know that the time that you had to run is bounded below by the distance of that diffeomorphism from the identity divided by the square root of the energy budget that you had. So among all velocity fields with the energy less than E0, you can definitively give a bound on the duration you had to go in time in order to reach the stiffeomorphism via this metric property of the group, via the distance. And so it's reasonable then to name this, this quantity, the distance from the identity divided by your energy budget E0 to be the age of that diffeomorphism phi. <clears throat> so the, the theorem is then that nearby study states the age of the Lagrangian flow map that are generated by these non-autonomous solutions close by goes to infinity as t goes to infinity, namely that you get to infinite diameter in the group um, at long time, infinite distance in the group at long time. And what's the idea behind this? Well, it's it's really the idea of Ilyashberg and Ratu that in order to get far away, so to show that the diameter is infinite, you want to get far away from the identity. In order to get far away, you have to have twisting. So they, they consider little radial vortices where the periods are different, the same theme as in the rest of the talk. And they show via an invariant of the group, namely the Calabi invariant, which is somehow an average twisting in your domain, that the distance gets longer the more you twist. So if I run a twist map for time t, the distance will grow like t. And so considering a, a series of twist maps run for longer and longer time gives the example that the diameter is infinite. Well, I mean, here, the point is that the information that we get about the Lagrangian flow, namely that it twists not just particles, but actually bulks. Remember, it's like an L1 statement. So we have a bulk of particles moving in one direction and a bulk moving in the other. That's enough to also give a linear lower bound on the distance, which in turn translates to this statement about the age of the flow. So if you know a priori that your flow map comes from a velocity field with energy less than or equal to some fixed one, E0. Now that's something you can measure just by some instant of time, like you just run a little bit and you can compute the energy. Then just giving you a freeze frame of your Lagrangian state, you can tell me how, you know, at, at least how long you had to run it if, if originally things were in the identity configuration to get there. So that's some kind of irreversibility at the Lagrangian side. Okay, so I had some other things to say, but let me just end it there. So thank you. Thanks. Any questions? No. Yeah, I have a short question. Uh, Go ahead, please. Uh, I agree, Joe, uh, is it uh, uh, all the exponents that I see? They're mostly linear. Are there anything exponential in time? Yeah, yeah, that's a good. So the linear is very natural, and you think about twisting and shear flows. If you have hyperbolic points, so if you have, you know, you have, um, say, stagnation point, then. Okay, then then this this thing will give growth, exponential growth of gradients in some region, region that samples this point, of course. And that that geometry, actually, that type of hyperbolic point was exploited by Kiselev Shverak, I mentioned at the beginning, um, to give it an example of double exponential growth, which seems uh, which seems counterintuitive because because that's sort of exponential. The point is that under the Euler evolution, nonlinearly the thing steepens. So not only do you have eigenvalue there making you grow exponentially, but the eigenvalue itself is sort of growing because of steepening of the background. And so for Euler, that gives you an example of double exponential. There, there are some configurations on the torus which involve these hyperbolic points. 
which do give exponential in time lower bounds. It's not known if it could be faster. It's just a lower bound of exponential. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you do have that. It's a different mechanism entirely from this one that I'm describing, but it's certainly part of the picture. I, I think that, I mean, there, there's a question about what's sort of the generic behavior that you typically see at long time. And there, if you think about the images of from simulation, like, like you, you know, you, you say you go to a dipole, this, there is some hyperbolic point here, but there's typically no or very little mass of vorticity there. So that hyperbolic point is moving around, there's very little stuff there. Whereas each one of these vortices is creating this type of radial shear outside. And if there's a filament, it'll get stretched by that radial shear. So one might think that it's linear growth that you'll sort of see in the end, typically because of mechanism like that, but who, who knows? Yeah. But in between vortices, there must be some some hyperbolic uh, points, yeah, right? Yeah, right. There's a hyperbolic point here, but then the question is like, uh, uh, how much does that really? How much is that seen at the level of? So you you don't see that hyperbolic point in terms of growth of vorticity, except right there. Whereas everywhere else here, you're going to see linear growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, if, any other question? If not, let's thank the speaker.